Corinthians chapter number 1. We'll begin reading in verse number 5. I referenced this verse last week during last week's Sunday school. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, first off, verse number five. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally. Right? I'm glad we don't serve a stingy God. Right? But particularly when it comes to wisdom, right? God doesn't want you in the dark. He doesn't want you wondering what, you know, the will of God for your life is. God doesn't want you wondering, you know, what is right, what is wrong. Why do you think that, you know, I said he doesn't want us in the dark because his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, right? When, I mean, the book of John describes Jesus as the light walked among men in darkness, right? Christ was light. Everything that he taught, people hadn't heard before. Even as a 12-year-old, when he went to, you know, Jerusalem for the Passover feast, he went to the temple and the wisest of the wise were astonished at the answers that a 12-year-old could give them on things that they didn't understand, right? Why? Because he was light. He was giving them with them. Some of them received it. Some of them rejected it, right? We know that as, you know, Paul and Jesus and many others, it says, and many believed on him there. Right? We never get numbers, but everywhere that he went, people that were looking for light found the light, and they received it. Right? They were wondering what was it, like the woman at the well. Let's take her for example. She was wondering. She had questions. She said, our fathers worship up here in the mountains. Right? You worship down in the temple. What's right? And then he told her, but if she hadn't wondered, if she wasn't inquisitive, Right? She happened to ask the right one. That was God. Right? So when it says, if any man like wisdom, let him ask of God. Right? God doesn't want you waffling about. Doesn't want you flip-flopping like John Kerry. Right? Anybody remember that joker? But anyway. Flip-flopping on whether this is right, whether this is wrong. But more importantly than that, God doesn't want you wavering when it comes to the key things of your life. Okay? It goes on to say, verse number 5, He upbraideth not. God won't make fun of you for asking a question in sincerity. God won't, and because God is long-suffering, because God is full of grace and mercy, and not like Jordan, okay? If you ask the Lord a question sincerely, no matter how dumb we may think it is, if you don't know the answer, God won't upbraid you for it. In fact, God will comfort you and encourage you that He cares just as much about the little things even more than you do. Right? There's no question that's too simple or too, you know, minute, that's the word I'm looking for, too small that God won't take the time to answer it if you're willing to listen. Right? doesn't upbraid you. He doesn't say, well, why are you wasting my time bringing me that kind of question? No, because God doesn't want you in uncertainty. God wants you to know one way or the other. And then it says, And upbraid is not, and it shall be given to it. doesn't say that if you pray hard enough, doesn't say if you give enough, doesn't say if you hand out enough tracts that God's going to answer your questions. No, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And then it says, and it shall be given him. That's not an if-then statement. If you ask and then go do this, it shall be given. No, no, no. If you ask, it shall be given. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Same principle, except what's the condition that Christ put on that? You know, if we ask and we don't receive, why? Because we want to consume it upon our own lust. Right? It's something that God wasn't interested in in the first place. Okay, now, you can spend all your time wanting to know the answers to some of the prophecies, 
that we know certain things are going to happen we don't know how they're going to happen right that's not wisdom that's just you wanting to know for your own sake right anything that takes away from you know what God desires for you to do what's that to be salt of the earth light of the earth right? there are certain things that he didn't write down that we don't need to know I'd like to know where dinosaurs came from and where they went how they went away because I know it wasn't a meteor right a lot of people say well it might have been in the flood might have been this might have been that well maybe after the garden of Eden when there wasn't a perfect environment anymore they all got eaten by something I don't know right all that being said doesn't matter worth anything what's that got to do with me living for Christ right there's wisdom and then there's foolishness right some people swallow camels strain at gnats right they will accept that a holy God walked into the womb of a virgin right but then they want to know how God's going to take care of them but Lord where's the money going to come from that's foolishness doesn't say that God needs to explain every minute where's the money coming from God that's all I need to know right who's going to take care of it God that's all that I need to know well how's he going to take care of it that's called doubting God do you understand that when I mean dad said it on Wednesday night why 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 that was me as a child okay that's why I know so much nowadays because I asked why but I played that game with Bella one day Bella was over at the house and she said well why and I told her and she said well why about that and then I told her and we I went for about 15 minutes going as far down the rabbit hole as I could and then eventually she said why and I said I don't know right Bella really wasn't interested in why she was just trying to avoid I believe it was getting in the car with mom and dad when they got there in a few minutes I said hey you gotta go put your shoes on why because your mom and dad are coming why because it's time for you to leave why because they're done with whatever they're doing and we just went further and further we as Christians a lot of times God will say cast all your cares upon us or cast all of our cares upon him but then we also say okay Lord now that I've given it to you how are you going to handle it well, if you really trusted that he would have taken care of it, it doesn't matter how he's going to take care of it. Right? That's the, if a child goes up to a parent and says, hey, can I have some food? If the parents say yes, or they say, give me five minutes, what's the kid do? Runs back outside, doesn't think twice about it. When they call, get called back in, food's going to be there. It's that unconditional trust. Well, mom or dad said it, so it's true. The kid doesn't stand there and say, well, how are you going to make it? what are you going to make can I have this on it can I have that on I said food be ready in a minute go play or do something right let me get it ready right but likewise when we ask the Lord a question when we truly want to know he will answer but when we get involved in all the details that may not be the will of God for you know all the details four Hebrew children didn't know how they were coming out of the furnace but they said God's able and if he does great if he doesn't we're going to be with him and so we're going to Abraham's bosom we know what's going on with us what's going on with you now luckily fourth man was waiting for him in the fire right Daniel had the law that was signed against him said if any man ask anything of any God or deity other than the king he going in the lion's den. What'd he do? He went home and prayed. He did what he knew he was supposed to do. Then when the verdict came down, I mean, it broke the king's heart in order to sentence Daniel. But when the king sentenced him, I don't find Daniel over in the corner wringing his hands wondering what's going to happen. In fact, the king knew that Daniel's God was able to do so. He came back in the morning. I wonder how many other people the king had thrown into the lion's den he came the next morning to check up on hey you guys okay down there no they went into the lion's den but there's something about Daniel's God right he said well Daniel just had faith that everything's going to be okay right there's, there's something different there. and then you go and study it out you know 
came to rise. His dad was a hosseress who was a hosseress married to the second, well, I don't even know if it was the second time. Man, I'm more wise than that. Right? But who was he married to? Esther. Who was Esther's adoptive father? Which technically, he was her uncle. But she took him in. The Bible says he took her into her own home as if it was his own daughter. So who was Darius's grandpa? Old Mordecai. Right? He had heard about and he had always wondered. And that morning he came back when he said, Daniel, is your God able? What he was really saying is, did God take care of you? And the answer was, O king, live forever. Right? The answer was, yeah, God's able to take care of me. He came and he asked one of God's people for an answer about God, and God delivered unto King Darius. Yeah, God's able to keep you in the lion's den. And it's not like he left them down there all alone. Oh no, an angel came down and shut up the mouth. What do you think Daniel did all night? He's asking questions about God to the angel. Right? The angel was ministering unto Daniel. Right? He was just saying, hey, you mind if I ask you a few questions? Maybe God doesn't want you to give me the answer. But, but how do you know? Because God entrusted Daniel with a whole lot of prophecy. God entrusted Daniel to be the one that wrote down exactly word for word what God said. Right? In fact, a lot of Daniel deals with the end times. Daniel didn't understand it, but he just said, okay, Lord, I'll write it down. And it's been passed down through centuries so others can know this is what God said on it. Right? Why did we go down that whole line of people to get to the point wavering is when you say you give something, but you're really not that sure. You go through all the outward appearances of saying, okay, I'm committed, but then you waver. Daniel didn't pace the floors of his house. Daniel didn't pace the floor of his house saying, well, I wonder if God's going to be able to take care of me if I don't pray today. Should I pray to God today? No, it's settled in his heart. When David lived in caves, right, on the run from Saul, he made, you know, God made a place of security around him in the midst of the Philistines right the ones that hated David right other enemies that he had fought before God had a safe haven there I don't think David went to sleep every night wondering was God going to be able to keep me safe from the Philistines no he already knew that he's just wondering how God wanted to take care of it he said Lord I'm not going to kill Saul in fact several times God made an opportunity he said I will not lay my hand on God's anointed that's God's man God will sort him out right he didn't care how God was going to do it he just said Lord I desire to be back home I want my family to be safe in fact he took his family out of Israel and entrusted them to a foreign king while he was on the run all that time I don't find that David went back and checked on his family a whole bunch Saying, hey, is God still taking care of you? He knew God was going to take care of him. He was just saying, Lord, what do you want me to do today? I'm on the run. I need instructions today. Never did he waffle on the fact that he was all in for God. Right? But each day he came back and he said, Lord, I need a little bit more wisdom today. Lord, I need to know what you desire for me to do today. Right? Let's move down to verse number 6. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed now we know that in the scriptures the wind picture of Holy Spirit right if we're driven by the Spirit we'll always be going in the right direction right but the waves they've got more than one wind right in fact that's how currents happen in the ocean because of differing air pressure or air temperatures wind starts moving right now wind starts moving the water underneath of the wind gets pushed in that direction and then you get these giant jet or gulf streams in the ocean where you can go all the way up to England and there's like this place that looks like a tropical garden why because all the warm water from the Caribbean gets pushed up that way you say that don't make sense huh? that's why God's in control of it right you say well that doesn't make sense to the natural man yeah, I don't know God can do what he wants to do. But those waves, 
any of y'all? I mean, there are places where they say the Pacific Ocean and then other seas, like the China Sea or the, uh, the North Sea, right, the one with all the fishermen on the Discovery Channel go up there and catch crabs, that sea. They say you can go out and you can see the line where that sea meets the ocean. And they say, well, how in the world is that? Because you got winds blowing the, the sea out to the ocean, and then you got winds from the ocean blowing back towards the sea, and it just looks like waves are hitting into each other. It makes a white foam line almost. And they say where the Atlantic meets the Pacific down around, you know, Argentina. Okay, where the Indian Ocean meets the Atlantic in the Pacific, all those great winds that drive those oceans, they collide in one spot and the waves crash into each other. Right? They cancel each other out. Sometimes, depending on, you know, where the water is, if it's fresh water and salt water, they say you can see the different colors of the water. Right? Because of what's in the water. And it's not mixing, it's just crashing into each other. There's a division. Right? Now, can't remember if it's in Psalms or in Proverbs right now. But there's an illustration that there are deep waters of our soul, and there's a well that's been entrusted to us that springs up with everlasting life. But we've been saying there's a whole lot of water there. But what happens when we move away from the things of God? Water's not bubbling no more. Because the water is stirred up by the one that stirred us up originally. But if I'm contrary to the Holy Ghost, if I've grieved him and quenched him in my life, water's not bubbling no more, it's still. And my soul knows that there's something wrong with still water. You know what happens in still water? That's where if something dies, it becomes contaminated. If something falls into the water because it's not moving, it doesn't wash away the contamination. Instead, it becomes polluted. And then eventually it becomes toxic. That's why in most survival manuals, they will tell you if it's a puddle and there ain't water moving into it and water moving out of it, try and steer away from that sucker. Don't drink of the still water. Find moving water, water that's alive. It's in the process of getting from somewhere small to somewhere bigger. Right? Use that water. Because since it's been moving, nothing's been able to get into it and contaminate it. So we know that still water spiritually is bad. Right? Dead water, not good. But see, those winds of the Holy Spirit, if they're not the ones driving us, if He's not the one causing that well to bubble up into everlasting life, right? we're liable to be driven by any wind. Some people, and I do not understand these people, but some people, they can't just sit. They have to be doing something all the time. I don't get it, right? I can do something and not move, right? I can be working on something and also not be touching everything on the desk, right? I can sit there and enjoy something without having to get up and go check on this and check on that and check on this and check on this and do that. Right? I can sit there and do nothing really well. Right? If there was an Olympic event for doing nothing, I'm pretty sure I could represent the United States. Okay? I'm pretty good at doing nothing. Right? But some people, like me, recharge when they're not around people. Other people thrive off of being around other people, doing something. Right? But likewise for me, me who, very caught, well, not cautious, but very deliberate. I don't want to make the wrong move, so I, I wait until I know this is exactly what I know I need to do. Right? Other people, maybe I don't have enough faith. Maybe that's what it is. Right? I don't just launch out on the Word of God. Right? Although, if God gives me a verse, I'll do it. Not saying that way. But when I'm in doubt, right, just like this wind, I'm stubborn. Now, I don't know if I want to go that way. Other people are, well, hey, I should be moving right now. Well, Moses told Israel, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. But at the same time, if God says go and you don't, you're going to be hurting. 
right? The winds of self, the winds of the world, winds of others, right? They all drive against one another. More importantly, usually they drive against the things of God. That's why when we waver, well, do I do this or do I do that? Or I gave it to God, but now I need reassurance that God's going to be able to take care of it. You know what that does in your life? You're just standing still. You're like that line in the ocean. You're not going this way. You're not going that way. You're caught up in that undercurrent. This wave will crash against you, and then you come back up, and another one's pulling you back down. Every time you try to go one direction, another wind will come in from this direction that causes you to stand still. But as a result, spiritually, you're not moving. You're dead. In fact, you're kind of trapped. It's like quicksand. That undercurrent just keeps grabbing you and pulling you back down. You come up just enough for air and then feel like you're going back down. Every Sunday you come in and you're trying to just get a lung full of air and then by the time we leave and we spend a week out in the world, you come back and you feel like you haven't made any progress. Right? You feel like you're in the same spot. Right? Well, what was the condition that you ask of God shall be given to you but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. Right? You may have a desire in your heart that isn't wavering. Right? Like I wish that there was a way that somehow there was a rich uncle I know I didn't have that died and then somehow it skipped either mom or dad because, you know, if it's an uncle, it means that I'm, it's, they're related to them somehow and then I end up with all the money. I'd love to take care of all the missionaries up on that board and then some. Right? I'd love to make sure that they want for nothing, they need for nothing, especially because, because of COVID. You know, America, some things have kept churning. Other places, it's all shut down. Dad talked about the Prayman yesterday. They see you driving around in a car without a mask on. They pull you over down there, write you a $1,000 ticket in your own car. Right? Well, what's the... Right? Yeah, other places just shut down. And there's been some that asked the Lord in faith, Lord, we know you're going to take care of this, but I'd love to make sure none of them want for anything. Right? There are some desires that are unwavering in your life. But if you waver in other parts of your life, that one thing that you really want to see God do, He can't reward because your whole life isn't based on faith in God. Right? A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. One area of wavering causes your entire life to waver. Right? Example. I pray for my lost loved one to get saved. Right? I know you can take care of it, Lord. I know that you're able to save them, that you can send somebody by their way. You can use me. You can use somebody else. I know that you can use whoever you want to use to make sure that that person gets saved. And then... While I'm around that person all week long, I'm wondering, well, how are the bills going to get paid? How's this going to happen? Right? Well, are you going to church on Wednesday night? I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Wavering in other areas of my life. Maybe God wants to use me, but because of my uncertainty in other areas, it makes a negative impact on that person. Because I have wavered, God cannot do what God wanted, him, or wanted to do, what I wanted God to do. But in that situation, I know it's right. It's God's will that none should perish, but they're also come to repentance. Right? Likewise, we've been praying for revival. Right? But if we wonder, when we come in, well, I wonder why that person got, got to sing today. Because God told the pastor to let him sing today. Right? That's the, I'm supposed to come in ready to worship. That's, that means to do some work. I want to give back to God. I'm not worried in looking, not worried in talking, not worried in getting up and saying, but if God told me to, I will. If God's got something burning on my heart, I'll stand up and say it. If the pastor says, anybody got testimony? Yeah. But if God doesn't, I'm not wavering. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to give back best I can. Just open up and say, Lord, I love you. Appreciate you. Thank you for all you've done for me. But if I come in wavering, well, how long is this going to last today? I've got something i got to do after this. 
Brad, or, man, that's the fourth person he's let sing today. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to the restaurant before everybody else. <laughs> or, man, how many points has he, he's had four points already, and this point's had more sub points than the rest of them. We get the point, Brother Doug. Right? Good luck following me, because points and sub points kind of gone out the window during Sunday school. When we preach, it might be a little bit different. But when we're going line by line, good luck following them points. They're not alliterated. But what is the point? Wavering all around will steal your joy from that service. A moment of, well, do I really get in or do I still stand between two opinions? Right? Am I 100% sold out? Or am I still... Just holding on to a little something. A little wavering causes you to go out and say, well, today just seemed like it's missing something. Well, maybe you was missing something. Maybe you were missing that little bit that you held back. And because you didn't give it, you walked out spiritually dead. Like Ananias and Sapphira. They sold it. But then they kept part of it, but wanted people to think that they gave all. Right? If you come in expecting to worship... You want to give God everything, but throughout the week you've wavered on prayer time, on Bible study. You may be able to worship a little, but you ain't going to be able to worship all in. A little waver is a lot of waver in the eyes of God. Because here's what it all boils down to. You know what wavering in the eyes of God, verse number 6, or verse number 7, For let not that man think he shall receive anything, from the Lord. Not just what you asked God, anything. You know why? Because in the eyes of God, wavering is saying, well, if I believe that God can take care of this, I'll give it to Him. But if not, I'm going to look for other people's help. If not, I'm going to read and see what I can discover. Well, man's learned a whole lot, and a whole lot of it ain't true. A whole lot of it glorifies man, a whole lot of it says how much you can do. Well, you can do some, but the arm of flesh will fail you. You're able to do some things, but not all things. But, but in the hand of God is an instrument of God. I can do all things through Christ. In fact, I'm more than conquerors. Or we're more than conquerors. I'm more than a conqueror. That was a plural. Point being, a little waver takes all the blessings of God away. Not just those that you asked for. Or those things that you wish to see God do in your life. That daily He loadeth us with benefits. Daily His promises are renewed towards us. Well, if I waver, what I'm asking God to do is shut off the spigot. When I waver, I'm saying, Lord, I don't trust you to handle this problem. So really, I don't have enough faith for you to help in all these other things. It'd be the same as Anybody ever waver on which uh, cable provider to use? Right? Well, which one's better? Does well, this, this one do this or this one do that? Every year they call you, hey, we're going to raise your rates. Now I'm going back to the other guy. You guys have gone back and forth between cable providers 19 times in the past 10 years. Halfway through the year they say, well, it's going up. Okay, I'm switching. Come get your stuff. Right? Usually that works and they'll drop it. Right? But back and forth, back and forth. What? Well, maybe I need to look into this one. What's this whole sling TV thing? Oh, YouTube's got a TV thing now. That, all these options. There's always a lot of options in your life. But once you find out what's the best, right? usually best means that they're not going to try and pull the wool over your eyes the next year. Now you get locked in with the rate. You can't change it. Now you find something that works, you stick with it. That doesn't matter. Well, the guy down the road said that he got this new TV deal. Nope, this has worked. I'm sticking with it. Right? It went out one time, and they were out here to fix it the next day. If they weren't, I'd start looking for somebody else. They keep blowing. <coughs> if they keep blowing you off. I hate allergies. But wavering in the eyes of God is, is if you say, everything I've invested, I'm taking it back. Everything that I've ever entrusted into God, 
I don't know if he could handle this, which really means I don't know if he could have handled all that. A little bit of waver is if you're out in the middle of those wind-tossed seas in a boat and you pull up the sails and say, I don't know which way's right, so we're not going nowhere. God's trying to drive you in one direction. The world's trying to drive you in another. And you say, I don't know which way I want to go. Your inner man saying, go this way. The spiritual man saying, go that way. And you don't know which. So you just park shop. You don't drop anchor because you know you're supposed to be going somewhere. But you just stop. You know the thing with water? It does have currents. And if you get to a point that two currents are pushing against each other, if you're in the middle of that, it'll tear you apart. Eventually, those waves will start getting bigger as those winds start blowing stronger. And it'll start beating into the ship. And now, instead of waves on one side, you got waves on both sides. Wavering will literally tear you apart. Wavering will get you to the point that you not only doubt little things, you doubt big things. You doubt whether or not God's even able to take care of you. Some people get to the point that they've wavered, something happens in their life, and then they start blaming God for what happened in their life. I mean, it rains on the just and the unjust. I woke up yesterday to news that my car had been hit while I was asleep. And didn't do that much. You should have seen her car. No, no, but she hit the wheel. That sucker's solid. It did a whole lot of damage hurts, but for that brief moment, it was, well, of course, my car got hit. But then you start realizing, Brother Peter, this is the menace that took out a few mailboxes. I hit a tree when I wasn't even in the car. That takes talent. Right? And you start looking at all the time, well, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Not really, I felt bad for her. It was a brand new, brand new car. It still had the temporary tags on it. Yeah. But I also found out if a Camry and an Avalon get into a fight, an Avalon wins. <laughs> Boy, could have been a whole lot of waver. Well, how's it get there? Insurance. Just a car. I like that car. It's just a car. It could have been. Well, how in the world is the Lord going to take care of this? Where am I, what am I going to be able to drive while it's in the shop? Insurance, they'll give me a rental. If they don't, I'll go to my insurance, they'll give me a rental, and then they'll go after the other insurance for not giving me a rental. Right, but what if the other people don't want to fix it for what it would do? My insurance will do it and go after them. I'll have to pay a deductible, but hey, I'll get back eventually. Right, Lord's got it all figured out already. What am I supposed to worry about? Being Christ-like. Wavering draws your attention away from what God really desires you to do. If I'm worried with the details, if I don't trust that God's big enough to take care of the universe, He surely can take care of me. Right? That before He even made anything, He had the plan designed that Christ would die for my sins so that I could be saved. If He's got all that figured out, if He already knows the end from the beginning, I'm good. But I need to focus on me. I need to focus on what I can be for God and what's keeping me from being that for God. Because if I'm not doing the will of God in my life, it's because I'm wavering on something. Man cannot serve two masters. If I waver, I'm not making progress. If I waver, there's something that I could be doing for God that God desires for me to do that I'm not doing. And if I'm not doing it, I'll give an account for that one day. I'll have to stand before God, look into those eyes of fire, and say, it was because of my unbelief that I didn't. I didn't believe the word that you left behind for me. I didn't believe the example that your son lived while he was on earth, as an example unto us, how we should live. I was more concerned with side things, or footnotes as they might call them. Not important enough to be in the actual text, but if you were interested, you can find... I was looking at the footnotes of life, God. I wasn't really focused on what it was that you desired for me to do. I was more worried with accessories than really the meat of what it is to be a Christian, and that's service. 
We minister, we take of God's abundance, not my abundance, but every now and then, because of God's abundance, He does bless us, and we've got abundance. Right? But I take of the goodness of God, and I give to others that have no idea what it is. Or maybe they've forgotten what it is. Or maybe they've just been really low under a burden, and God wants me to be the one to go to them and say, Hey, we love you. We care about you. We want to help you bear this burden. But here's the goodness of God to remind you that it's not always doom and gloom. Although on days where the sun didn't hit like this, I'm kind of happy. It means it's not going to be hot today. Okay? I've been burning up all week. Maybe it's because I decided to keep the beard after corona season went away. I don't know what it is, but I get hot a whole lot easier. But what's it all boiled down to? If I'm not ministering, if I'm not taking, if I'm not marching as a good soldier of Jesus Christ towards the goal that he wants me to do, it's because I'm wavering. A whole lot of people are going to get to heaven and they're going to say, Lord, I'm sorry I didn't, but it's because I wavered. I wonder every now and then. I don't like math, but every now and then I wonder about things where I have to do math. Right, particularly about the Bible. Like the other day I was wondering, well, if there's 144,000 Jews that are saved out of the battle of Armageddon and there's a 1,000 years on earth, right, how many people are going to be left at the end of that when it says that those that were born in that time, right, they rebel against Christ, right? I was like, well, I wonder how many people that could be. Answer's around 8 billion. If the population growth is what it is today, you know, it's actually been going down. So if it's higher than that, it could be more. Right? You say, why'd you? Because I, I was curious. I wanted to know why. And I looked into it. Right? Other times, I wonder how tall the city of New Jerusalem is going to be. Because it says the walls are so big and the city so big. The city is as tall as airplanes fly at. Like 40,000 feet. And it ain't talking about walls. Because it also says the walls are a whole lot shorter. Right? You say, what's that mean? I don't know. I just know it's going to be big. I don't know if it's going to be one big skyscraper. I don't know what's going on. But God said it's going to be tall. Right, and then you start looking at how big just square footage it is. It takes up about half of the continental United States just this way by this way, not counting in that way, which we just talked about. What's that mean? A whole lot of people can fit. That's why a number that cannot be numbered is coming out. Right? But those things that I wonder about, the details. Sometimes we get involved in the details of things that don't matter. Really, what's, you know, how many people could be around at the end of the millennial reign? What's that got to do with me living for Christ today? Nothing, but it's just something I was curious about. Right, a lot of times being curious can get us into a whole lot of trouble. Right, well, I heard a commercial the other day that I could get this much money for, yeah, but how much you going to have to pay back in about two months? Right, well, I heard that you know these people specialize in taking care of this problem. God specializes in taking care of all problems. If God wants you to go to them, they're going to be the best people that can do the job for you. But if God don't want you to do, they're going to be the worst people for you. Well, I need this done around the house. Well, maybe that will just find a way of fixing itself if I'm just faithful and true to the things that I've been called to do. If fixing that means not reading my Bible for the day, does it really need to be fixed? If taking care of that means that I don't pray and focus and you know really get into that prayer closet where I try and get my spirit lined up with God's spirit, if I give that up, then by the end of the day, I'm going to be a mess. Right? I started off out of whack. How do you think I'm going to end up? But now, certainly I understand there are emergencies. You get caught off guard. Right, if you was in a car wreck and you was unconscious and they took you to the hospital, that's kind of out of your control. Right, I understand that those things come up. But if we make ourselves a pattern of instead of wavering, but a pattern of steadiness, a pattern of being firmly set upon the rock, that our roots go deep and we're like that tree planted by the waters, that the wind can blow, but I can't be moved. Right? Instead of, 
well, I'm on the rock, but the wind's blowing in a whole lot of sand off the beach, and I'm going to build in on that. Not going to work. Eventually, that house is going to waver, and then it's going to buckle. But if you, let's make this example. Brother Peter was kind enough to help me with the brakes on my car and the rotors. If we would have left one of them lug nuts just a little loose, it may not waver a whole lot. You may not even be able to see it waver. But eventually, because of the speed, the pressure, and just the force that goes into a tire from spinning that quick, it'll waver long enough, and eventually that lug nut's coming off. Well, if you've got enough lug nuts that aren't locked all the way down, your whole tire's coming off. And you won't be able to look back and say, well, that's what caused it, because it's just wavering a little bit. It's just vibrating a little bit and locked all the way down. And then now, you're stuck on the side of the road, and you don't know what you're going to do. Right? You don't even have the lug nuts to put the spare tire on, because they're they gone. But, but what's the point? Wavering doesn't seem like much. Big impact. Then it says if we waver, we won't receive anything of God. Don't think that you'll get anything from the hand of God. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Without faith, we're saying, I can do it. I didn't need Christ. Or maybe I needed Christ to save me. I don't need Christ to live a Christian life. Uh, he wanted a life more abundant for me, but I think I can make my life more abundant than Christ could. He called me to service, but I want to lead. He called me to minister, but I want to be ministered unto. You know where all that starts? Just a little bit of wavering. And when there's uncertainty, like those waves, you'll be driven with any wind. And if you're out there in the midst of it, it's going to tear you apart until you make a decision. And if you make the wrong one, it's going to get a whole lot worse than just being beat on by two different groups of waves. I was going to draw night of God. He'll draw night. He's going to meet you. You don't even have to go the whole way. But when it comes to wavering, Lord, draw me closer unto thee. Right? Like the request of the woman that came to Jesus, help my unbelief. Belief isn't a problem. It's the unbelief part. Help my doubt. Lord, give me a verse. Nail it down. Settle it in my life. So that I can hide thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Right? It only makes sense that if you believe that Jesus would save you, that he could take care of the rest of it. So then why do we let the flesh, do we let the world, do we let ourselves talk us out of trusting God? Just like it's instinct for a child to trust their parents. right? It's instinct for a person that's saved in Christ to trust God. So if that's not what we just instinct, you know, instinctively do, what talked us out of it? Right? You may not know. It may be one of them little things that you've not noticed. But if you get in here and you say, Lord, what keeps me from trusting you with everything? Lord, what keeps me wavering? If you truly desire and you truly believe God will give you the answer, you'll receive it because He gives wisdom to all men liberally. He won't upbraid you either. So, as we've got another revival meeting come up, right? I know that we've been encouraged to not only pray, not only to give up some of the things that we're accustomed to doing and then instead give that time to God. That's just a real fancy way of saying fasting. Right? I know we've been encouraged to do all them things, but if we took that time and we actually said, Lord, what keeps me from being what you want me to be? And we listened and we had the patience to stay there and wait on the answer. Not saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to pray, but we got 45 minutes. Some of y'all just said 45 minutes. But Lord, we got 45 minutes. Uh, I'd like to have the answer in that time. Daniel waited 21 days. Right? How many other people throughout the Bible had a promise from God and it took 100 years? Right? Some of them took a lifetime. 
Some of them, it wasn't even in their lifetime, but they went to the grave believing God would take care of it. Isaiah never got to see Christ, but he told us a whole lot about him. Right? Isaiah wrote in prophecy a whole lot. His name would be the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He met him one day in Abraham's bosom when he led captivity captive. But he had heard about him long before. He didn't doubt. If he'd have doubted, he wouldn't have read it down. Writ, wrote it down. I've been watching too much of Larry the Cable Guy. But the whole point is, little waver, he wouldn't have believed what God told him. He wouldn't have believed it enough to pin it down and to take it to Israel, God's people, so that they know that one day there will be one named Emmanuel, God with us. And the reason that he's coming is not to reign, but instead to save. He's coming back one day to reign. But the first time he came to redeem that which was lost. He didn't waver on that. In fact, most Baptists tell you, nope, we're pretty set on the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. Don't waver on that. Don't waver on that. He was buried and then he rose again. But were you there to say it? No. Well, you were there to see all the times that God delivered you before. Why do we waver? You were there when he saved you. So why don't you think that this he could take care of? And we waver. And then eventually a waver turns into a wobble. And then that wobble eventually will knock you out. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. But you'll tip over eventually. Carried about with every wind of doctrine as the Bible says. Whichever way something blows, you're going to try it. When instead, we're just supposed to unconditionally trust Him. If you've got a question, ask Him. He'll, he'll tell you. And He won't upbraid you. But if the answer is, you don't need to know that. Or if the answer is not now or no, we usually don't like them. If that's the answer, okay, Lord, and go on. Don't waver on it. Don't try and go and figure it out. Why? Because Sodom tried to figure everything out. You know what he came to the conclusion of? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Emptiness, except for God. You can labor your entire life away and it's all empty when you go to the grave. The only thing that lasts is what we do for Christ. But wavering keeps us from doing anything. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.